right, welcome everybody. In case you don't know me, my name is Sam Burton and I'm honored to be the pastor here at South Haven First United Methodist Church. And I wanna thank you for joining me and Jerry here in our beautiful sanctuary for our midweek Bible study. And so if you will, I invite you to take your Bible and open up to the Gospel of John, John chapter 18. And we're gonna be looking tonight at verses 12 through 14 and then skipping down and looking at verses 19 through 24. So once again, please, at this time, take your Bibles, open up to the Gospel of John, chapter 18, beginning with verse 12. And while you're opening up your Bible, I want to now invite you to join me as I also pray and open us up now to God and to the work of His Spirit also in our time of study. So let us pray. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, once again, we are honored and blessed to be here with you, connected, still one with each other with you through the power of your Holy Spirit. And also now through the power of your Holy Spirit, anoint us in a great and mighty way as we continue our journey, our journey through this great gospel given to us by you and by John. And so now, dear God, you lead us and you guide us. It's only you and you alone can do. Open us up. Open us up to your word and your message so that we can grow stronger, stronger in our relationship with you. So once again now, you bless, you lead, you guide. It's only you and you alone can do. And I ask this in your holy, mighty, and very precious name. Amen. All right, so now when we were together last week, we finished up verses 1 through 11, and we concluded by sharing different things that we could see in Jesus' life and in his actions. We saw his courage, how he didn't hide when they these crowd of soldiers and Jewish police officers came looking for him. He stood there waiting for them. He knew what was going to happen. We talked about how his authority is simply saying, I am he, saying I am the name of God, how the power of God caused all those soldiers and police officers to just fall to the ground. We talked about also how he watched out for his disciples. And we also talked about his obedience, being willing to drink the cup that God had called him to drink. And then we finished up our time by looking at verse 10 where Simon Peter draws the sword out and cuts the ear off the high priest slave. And we talked about how Peter most of the time is remembered for denying Jesus. And that from denying Jesus, people have gotten to a point that they even give him a, a worse rap than that. And they'll say he's a coward or that he actually betrayed Jesus in the same way that Judas did. But I think that's wrong. I don't think we need to be looking at Peter that way. Yes, in a moment of weakness, he will betray Jesus. But at that very moment, he showed great courage, willing to take over on 600 people, 600 men there. He was willing to take them on. In spite of the fact he still didn't understand, he didn't realize that what Jesus had to do was part of God's divine plan, not Peter's human plan. But still, he showed great courage all for the sake of Jesus. And so now the arrest has been made, okay? And as we pick up with verse 12, follow along with me. So the soldiers, their officer and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Then skip down to verse 19 with me. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. All right, so as we get into this there, first off in verses 12 through 14, John immediately points out that after 
Jesus is arrested, that he's immediately taken to see Annas, okay? And then a second thing John points out, he lets us know this, that Annas is actually the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who is now the current high priest. And he does this to let us know why, that Annas isn't a high priest. He is no longer the high priest at this moment. And so in knowing this, it leads us then to this question. Why was Jesus taken to see Annas in the first place? Since he no longer serves as the high priest. Or maybe like this. What is it that makes Annas then so important? That Jesus gets taken to him first. Well, there's several things going on here I want to share with you about. Okay, First off, I want you to know Annas had been the high priest. He has served as high priest somewhere between 9 to 10 years. Okay, Following in his footsteps were his four sons who also had served at high priest at different times, and now his son-in-law, Caiaphas, is the high priest. But what is it that still makes Annas important enough that Jesus is brought to him first? Well, now, back in the time before Rome, before the nation of Rome entered the picture, the, high, the office of the high priest, the high priest office, had always been what we call know as a lifetime appointment, a lifetime appointment. But when the Roman government came in and took control, suddenly the office of high priest now has become a position that went to the highest bidder, okay? And as a result now, the office of the high priest has become nothing more than an office or a position that is full of nothing but bribery and corruption. But most importantly, it is now a position that went to the person who was most willing to follow and go along with the Roman governor. You see, basically the high priest was now the one who was doing what? He went to work with and for Israel's enemy, Rome. It's the same kind of work that the despised tax collectors were also doing. They were accused of. And remember, who was it that was always looking down upon these tax collectors? Not just the people, but they were led, the people were led to look down upon the tax collectors by the priests, by the high priests, by the Sadducees, the scribes. And here they are doing the exact same thing that they're accusing the tax collectors of. Kind of lets you know the hypocrisy that Jesus is having to deal with here. But let's go back now to the original question. The original question is this, what is it that makes Annas so important? Well, Annas and his family, they were able to obtain, but more importantly, hold on to the office of high priest because of one reason and one reason only. They did it the good old fashioned worldly way of doing things. They did it through greed, and money. You see, Annas and his family were enormously wealthy. And one by one, each member of this family bribed their way, bought their way into the office of high priest. While at the same time, the whole time, Annas, he's the one who remains the power behind it all. He's the one that's in control behind the scenes. The question is, so how did Annas and his family become so extremely wealthy? Well, now, according to one of the commentators, one commentator pointed this out. One of the commentators I'm using, they said this, that Annas and his family made their money by controlling the selling of the animals that were used for sacrifice in the temple. Now, as you may already know, that there were two places to buy animals there at the time to be used for sacrifice. First off, you could buy them from merchants, merchants that were located outside the temple wall. Or secondly, you could buy them from merchants that were selling animals inside, inside the temple wall in the area known as the court of Gentiles, the outer part where everybody could come in, where they were selling in the court of Gentiles. And with this, all this going on, Annas and his family, they controlled 
two things, okay? First off, Annas was the one who controlled the inspectors. There were inspectors who had to approve if an animal was worthy, was perfect to be used as a sacrifice. And secondly, Annas was the one who owned all the booths that were selling animals that were located there in the court of Gentiles. So the thing is this, outside the temple, animals could be bought as low as for nine denarii, okay? But there within the court of Gentiles, the lowest an animal could be bought for was 15 denarii. But remember now, who was it that controlled the inspection? Who was it that controlled the approval of the animals that could be bought and used from outside the temple wall? Remember, the inspectors, and they worked for who? That's right. Remember, they worked for Annas and his family. And so this meant what? It meant that the majority of the animals bought outside the temple, they, were, they would be rejected when they were brought in. They were rejected and could not be used. And the one who wanted them to make a sacrifice to God, they then had to use an animal that was bought from one of those merchants located there in the court of Gentiles. And that area became known as this, as the bazaars of Annas. The bazaars of Annas were the merchants inside the court of the Gentiles. And it was through this then, the exploitation of the worshipers, through their exploitation that Annas and his family made their fortune. So you can see what Jesus was dealing with at this time. But as we see this about Annas and his family, there's also another question that can come up. And that question is this, why would Annas want to have Jesus brought before him in the first place? Well, so remember now, Jesus is the one who did what that would have hurt the wealth of Annas and his family the most. Remember what Jesus did at the beginning, back in chapter 3 of the Gospel of John? Remember how Jesus came and did what? That's right, he cleaned the temple out. He cleaned the temple, but when he did that, he did more than just turn over the tables of the money changers and release animals from their cages. Jesus also then spoke out. At that point, he spoke out against the corruption that was going on with the buying and the selling of the animals there within the temple. And with Jesus doing this, it then hit Annas and his family where it would hurt them the most. That's right, in the pocketbook, in their banking account. So maybe Annas only wanted Jesus to be brought before him because this would now be his time, his chance to do right. To do what? To gloat. To gloat over the arrest and defeat now of Jesus himself. So he's brought before Annas. Then we skip down to verse 19 to 24. So Jesus is brought before Annas to be questioned in what can only be described as nothing than a mockery of justice at that moment. In verse 19, John points out that Jesus is questioned by Annas concerning two things. First off, he is questioned about his disciples, and secondly, about his teaching. And the question becomes, what would have been the purpose? What would have been the purpose of questioning Jesus concerning these two specific things? Well, what we believe is this, is that Annas was hoping hoping that he could get information from Jesus. He could get information from Jesus that would not necessarily, would not be used in a Jewish court. But instead, he was wanting to get information from Jesus that could be used to bring Jesus down in a Roman court, not a Jewish court. They wanted to go at him in a Roman court. And by questioning Jesus about his disciples and his teachings, they hoped then, it was hoped that they could then show how Jesus is a true threat to Rome in either one, one of two ways or two ways together, okay? First off, either by the message of his teachings that could be shown, interpreted, that Jesus was completely anti-Rome. And if you said anything against Rome, if you were anti-Rome in any way, 
you were hung on a cross. You were killed. Or secondly, that Jesus had great strength, not only in the number of his disciples, but also in a large number of his followers. And that they could show that Jesus had enough people with him, not, enough, not just disciples, but followers, that he could then do what? Start a revolt, a revolution against Rome. And once again, that's a killing, a dying offense, okay? They want to get him in a Roman court. But as they question Jesus about his disciples and his teaching, we see there again in verses 20 and 21, we read that Jesus, he doesn't fall for it. He does not fall for what Honest is trying to make him do. Jesus instead, he simply refused to respond with what Honest wanted to hear. Instead, Jesus says this in 20 and 21, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. Now with this response, let us first and foremost understand this, that Jesus was not giving honest some kind of arrogant, or boastful comeback, okay? He wasn't being a smart aleck, okay? He's not being arrogant. He's not being boastful. But in saying this, Jesus is simply pointing out three things with this response. Now, first off, in this whole thing that's going on, being brought there in this mockery of justice, it is possible that even though this was an informal hearing that violated the accepted Jewish legal practices, it is possible that it was nothing more than an inquiry to question witnesses, not to question Jesus, but to question witnesses that could be used, to be used in the case against Jesus when he went to trial. And Jesus is just letting Honest know if this is the case. He's letting Honest and all the others that are there at that time know this, that if they are seeking witnesses about him, about his disciples, about his teachings, then they're going to have plenty of witnesses to choose from. Because as he's saying to them, he's always been open. He never has spoken in hiding or behind people's backs. He's always been open and willing for everyone to hear what he had to say. And if you want to question people about what he said, you're going to find plenty of witnesses. Go ahead and ask. But second, Jesus was also simply pointing out the truth about why he came and what he always spoke about. Why he came and what he always spoke about. Jesus' mission had always been to go and do one thing, to proclaim God's truth to everyone. He came to do the will of God, but his mission was to proclaim God's truth, the truth about the power of, and the gift of God's love. And it would be God's love that takes Jesus to the cross. And it'll be then the power of his forgiveness for all people that will bring the gift of salvation. Forgiveness for all of our sins into this world. And Jesus has completely fulfilled what he came to do in such a way that there would now be thousands of people, thousands of people who not only heard what he said, but also thousands that would be willing to be a witness then at his trial. But then the third thing, the biggest one of all, Jesus says then what he said because he also knew what very important truth. What very important truth did Jesus know at this moment? You see, Jesus knows that no matter what happens from this point forward, that he's not going to get a fair trial. He knows it. He knows that he's not going to get a fair trial, but that's okay. That's okay with Jesus because Jesus, he isn't interested in getting a fair trial. He's only interested in one thing and one thing only, and that is to do the will of God and complete the reason why he came. Escaping execution, escaping the cross, friends, that's the last thing on Jesus' mind. That's the last thing. He knows what he's got to do. And he knows he's not going to get a fair trial. But that's okay with Jesus. 
Well, when he says what he says there in verses 20 and 21, then you get to verse 22. We see that in response to what Jesus says, a Jewish police officer then strikes Jesus on his face, followed by rebuking him, saying, is that how you answer the high priest? But once again there in verse 23, Jesus responds by being hit, slapped in his face with this statement. If I've spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. If I said, if I'm lying, fine, hit me. But if I've spoken rightly, if I've spoken the truth, then why do you strike me? You see, with Jesus responding then in this way after being struck, struck, slapped in his face, there are two very specific truths that we need to now see, that we can clearly see. First off, that since everything that Jesus had not only spoken, but he also had lived out before everyone. Since all that was nothing but the complete truth, that any kind of crime, any kind of crime that they're going to charge against him will come from only out of one thing, out of complete falsehood or lies. Okay? And the big thing is this. Honest and the others that were there, they know this. Being struck on his face. And it shows how those who are living within this state of falsehood, this mindset of lies, how they will always lash out at any kind of truth that they know they cannot disprove. Sounds like today, doesn't it? If they can't disprove the truth, if they know the truth is correct, then they're going to do whatever they can to destroy it and get rid of it. And this desire of falsehood to seek and destroy the truth that Jesus had always spoken and lived out each day is soon going to go for more than just a strike or a slap on his face. Their desire to completely destroy God's truth will soon be found then in the nails, in the nails that will be used to crucify Jesus. That's how far they want to go to stop the truth that they cannot disprove. But there's a second truth here, that in their desire to destroy the truth, those who live in falsehood, they're going to hide their agenda by doing what they call, well, we're still, we're actually searching for truth. Those that are in falsehood, who can't prove, can't disprove the truth, they're going to try and cover it up by saying, well, we're actually searching for the truth. But just as they came and arrested Jesus in the cover of darkness, remember that was always the plan. They didn't dare do this in the daytime in front of everybody there in Jerusalem. They had to do it in darkness behind everybody's back because they knew they couldn't just prove the truth openly. Just as they arrested Jesus under cover of darkness, those who seek to follow their own lie, their own way of wanting to do things will also use darkness, any kind of darkness, to cover up their own version, their own version of the truth. And one of the ways that people will seek to cover in darkness their own version of truth, especially today, is by using this statement, well, God told me to do this. See, I believe that's what they're thinking. They think, well, God has told me that we got to stop this man. Remember, Caiaphas is the one that said, well, it's better that one man die than the entire nation. And I can imagine him prefacing it with or ending it with, and God told me to say this. You see, I've seen this myself too many times when a person's seeking to justify their version of the truth by saying those exact same words. Even when it was obvious that that person was trying to do or what they were trying to say was not what God wanted. They still kept seeking to cover the truth with those words, with that lie. Because you know that's not what God wanted. And so people cover you up. They're doing whatever they can to justify, to cover the truth up with their darkness. But here's the good news. Through all this, Jesus still... He knows one very specific thing. He knows this, that God's truth will win out over these lies and this falsehood. That even when it looks as if truth is about to be overcome by the darkness of lies or the darkness of falsehood, he knows this, that in the end, truth, God's truth, 
will overcome the darkness. And that the light of God's truth is always going to shine through. And all that you and I have to do in our lives, all we've got to do, friends, is do the exact same thing that Jesus did. That as the darkness of lies and falsehood tried to come upon you just as it came upon him, we've got to do what Jesus did. And that is to trust in the light of God's truth. Jesus trusted in the light of God's truth because you never see Jesus do what? You never see him panic. You never see him worry about what's about to happen to him. He never loses it. And we are called to do the same thing, that when the lies want to come up against us, the way things are today, so many, you speak out and people don't like it. They don't like that truth. They're going to try and break it apart. They're going to try and mess it up with darkness and to cover it up and do away with it. But all you've got to do is what? Do what Jesus did and trust in God's truth and know that the light of his truth will always shine through the darkness. And so we're going to end here as we look at this. And next week, we're going to pick up with verses 15 through 18 and then skip down to 25 through 27 and maybe work our way into 28 where Jesus then goes before Pilate. But next week is about Peter. Peter denying Jesus, okay? And so I want to thank you for being with me and Jerry once again here for our midweek study. And until we're together again, take care and God bless. Goodbye.